Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Where's My Masculinity? Today I have a very interesting guest, Dr. Tabang Sifalafala from the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. He's written a very interesting paper which I would love to talk to him about. Um, it's called The Working Class Imaginary and Masculine Integrity, the Case of Former Mine Workers in Valcom. I'd like to start first by reading the abstract of the paper before we get uh, into things. It says, the gold mining industry was central to the making of the South African, Southern African working class. The industry drew migrant labor not only from South Africa, but from the region. The discovery of gold in the Valcom and Virginia areas led to one of the largest concentrations of migrant labor, especially from Lesotho. With over 10 gold mines, each with multiple shafts, in the 1970s, over 180,000 workers had direct employment on the mines. By the 1990s, as the ore was mined out, mine closure saw massive retrenchments, even 10,000 at a time, when Rand Mines and Harmony closed operations. Today, the gold fields employ less than 30,000 mine workers. As mines reached the end of their lifespan, more mine workers' um, closure activities were underway. This article focuses on the lives of retrenched gold mine workers, drawing on ethnographic fieldwork and interviews in Valcom and Lesotho, by foregrounding the voices of unemployed former mine workers, I examined the less explored question of the experience of unemployment. What did it mean for former mine workers to have wage, work, and lose it? The article shows that wage work meant social status and masculine integrity. Losing wage work not only meant poverty, but the survival of the working class imaginary bereft of outlets. Firstly, what inspired this line of, of, of research? I think it's quite fascinating and very relevant, particularly where we are in this, in this economy. So what led you to, 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 to go about this line of research? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andy and um, What actually led me to this line of research is, you know, the, the feeling that um, while unemployment is one of the most pressing challenges in the country, we don't really understand it. It's, it's right. depth. We tend to look at the economic aspect of it, which is very important. So we tend to look at the, the way that it causes poverty, um, the way that it, um, you know, yeah, basically means that people can sustain their livelihoods mm -hmm. um, and, and that kind of thing. But what are, what became clear to me is that we need a deeper understanding of unemployment mm -hmm. because the economic aspect is only one aspect of the problem. Mm. Uh, the unemployed experience unemployment in very you know, myriad of ways. Mm -hmm. right? There are other dimensions. The question of personal integrity, uh, the question of status, uh, the question of uh, the community that one gets to be a part of when they work. Mm -hmm. right? When you become mm -hmm. unemployed, that becomes lost. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of sense of solidarities that are provided through mm -hmm. work also get lost. So there's so much that gets lost when a person becomes unemployed, not just the income or the money, and that's the point I was trying to make. Yeah. You know, there's a, <clears throat> uh, a passage that you say, um, says, integrity meant the ability to preside responsibly over the household, that is to make my carabello. Yeah. This means taking care of basic material expectations of provision which were important conceptions of moral authority and manhood. Now, <clears throat> is part of this loss of unemployment, at least for the mine workers that were affected by it, for them almost the sense of a loss of manhood if ultimately in these communities manhood is tied very solely to, to provision? Yeah. So the, the context is that um, basically gendered identity shift so before the mines or before uh, mm. you know, the wage economy, masculinities were constructed in different forms. Right. So it, it could be through subsistence agriculture or sometimes through religion, religious affiliation. There were other ways of thinking about masculine integrity. Mm. But when industrialization took place and people became uh, dispossessed of land mm. and all the other uh, bases of the pre-industrial masculinities, all of that crumbled, right? And so 
what we get with the capitalist, you know, capitalist society mm. is that masculinity becomes tied to wage labor, mm. right? Mm. And so it, it becomes the dominant form of becoming a man, right, mm. in society. And so provision previously wasn't really tied to wages. My right. garavelo could be attained through agriculture, it could right. be attained in, in other ways, right? But once the wage economy became so dominant, it, it tied the idea of being a breadwinner, uh, the ability to provide for one's family, mm. to whether you work or whether you earn wages Which or don't. And so <clears throat> that's, that's the shift. So what, what it shows us is that masculine identities are not fixed, that different contexts can lead to different conceptions of masculinity. And in the world that we live in today, the most dominant, the, the most dominant form of being a man is yes. through engaging in wage labor. So on that, um, one of the stats, so you, you looked at uh, Valcom, and one of the stats you, you mentioned that since the decline of mining, the town has found it extremely difficult to diversify and move beyond the founding industries of mining and agriculture. Today, one of the largest employers in Valcom, the public sector, retail, finance, and services have also created many jobs for the locals, but not enough to replace the number of jobs lost in the town. Yeah. It is one of the worst performing areas in South Africa with an unemployment rate exceeding 37% and negative economic growth rates. Yeah. Due to the lack of stable income for many families, it is estimated that 50% of Valcom lives below the poverty line. Based on what you've explained now, <clears throat> that does that then mean if in this community you're a man and you're a wage earner, then by virtue you're, you're a king, right? And any other facets of your character and who you are are negated by virtue of the fact that you're a wage earner. Would you say that's a fair assessment of what industrialization, based on what you explained, has sort of um, come to define masculine integrity as in these communities? Yeah, you know, so so um, the traditional aspect, so the traditional aspect would, was one of the main ways in which some kind of, some level of respect would still be right uh, uh, attributed to a man even if it doesn't work. So for example, in the free state, you know, they use the word in that to, yes. to refer yeah. to a male person. Yeah. Uh, but there are also shifts in that. In that Ndate is actually, in the, the traditional sense, it's a reference to a male person, right? But it's also got connotations of the, the ability for one to carry their maikarabe, mm, right? Mm. So the shift is that even though one is still called Ndate, there is still this idea that you are Ndate be, not because of your ability to play your moral duty of provision, but you are just because you are a man, mm -hmm. and and that's where you can still get a bit of respect attributed to you. And so, in the context of unemployment, when these guys lost their jobs, they didn't sit, they didn't give up. Right? They still tried to do certain things to try and provide, provide, yeah, right. and reclaim their masculinity and all of that. And they resorted to the informal sector. And so, for example, the uh, men standing by the side of the road, uh, day laborers, I think we see them all over the country. Yeah. And we see the scrap metal collecting. Right. And garbage collection and right. where they take all of that to the buyback centers. Yes. Uh, some of them even tried entrepreneurship, right? But mm -hmm. obviously, be, having been an, a mine worker all your life, yeah, and, and then you try and become a, an entrepreneur in your, yeah. in your later years, you know, uh, you know, then it doesn't work out. But besides that, the, in, the, in the household, you still had other sources of income. You had grants, you had remittances, um, and then they would pull together all those resources in the family and try and provide, right? Right. But the interesting thing was that none of those um, livelihood strategies or sources of income overcame the sense of emasculation that resulted from losing wage work. 
it's interesting you, you mentioned that because um, uh, before I, I, I get to that, for people who don't know, uh, could you just explain what my caravel means? Because <laughs> 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 we've been using that term and, uh, and I'm sure not everyone knows what that means. Yes. yes. So my caravello is a, basically a sort of word for taking one's responsibility, yeah. bearing one's responsibility. And in this context of manhood, bearing one's responsibility was linked to having the breadwinner status right. and having the ability to provide, you know, to sustain the livelihoods and the social reproduction of the family, which was attained through work. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting you mentioned the, the provision part because <clears throat> as I read your paper, um, just to put it in, in context, you you interviewed about 60 mi uh, former mine workers. Um, on average, these mine workers had worked um, in the gold mines for about 15 years. Yeah. So their ages ranged between 40 and, and 55. Yes. And I know you're not a you know psychologist or anything, but I'm very interested to find out what was your sense that you got from them about trying to reimagine themselves as, as, as men in a context where their identity of where their manhood was at had been completely taken away from them. Mm -hmm. So where did the identity shift? Yes, yeah, so, so how, how did you, how did you sort of find that, that tension in them of trying to make that identity shift? So, you know, did most of them accept that their identity had to shift or is they still sort of like a holding on to, I mean, after 15 years, mm. right, that this is the sense of masculinity and manhood, mm. um, almost like being in denial and mm -hmm. all of this kind of stuff. Uh, what was your feel of the 60 men in terms of where they sat on that spectrum? Yeah, so th that's, that's a very interesting question because um, I think there's a sense of... Um, Okay, so, so it, it, it was interesting that what shifted wasn't the idea of masculinity. What shifted are the social conditions that made that masculinity possible. So the fact that there are no jobs doesn't change, didn't really change how they thought jobs, the connection with jobs is so central to. So the, that sense of masculinity remained even though the conditions that supported it had shifted. And obviously that has massive implications, right? Mm. Because it's almost like clinging on to something that is no longer viable or no longer there or impossible to attain. You know, I mean, it's so sad to talk about jobs in this country because mm. there are no jobs. Mm. The job, mm. job opportunities are very, very limited mm. for majority of people that look for jobs. There are simply no jobs, right? And, and we can see that in the low labor absorption rate of the economy. So, what's shifting is not the conception of masculinity. What's shifting is the conditions that make that conception of masculinity possible. And yeah, that that's that it's tenacious. Even unemployment is widespread, but this idea that the work is so important to being a man, yeah, yeah. remain solid. And it's, it's interesting because I mean you, you've, you've preempted my, my next uh, question uh, in terms of that shift because it says here, um, I'm just paraphrasing, the new miner or career miner of that period, so he's referring to the 1970s and 80s, was unlike the older mine worker with deep attachments to the land and subsistence agriculture. Instead, the new miner perceived wages as the central dynamic of the human experience. Wage work was no longer only an institution to earn money to support subsistence agriculture, but it became an institution tied to meaningfully constructing a sense of purpose, identity, dignity, and respectability. Dependency was created on wages, and they became the means by which masculine integrity came to be understood and practiced. Mm -hmm. So I think, based on what you said earlier, it's, it's quite clear from this passage that the, you know, this tying of manhood to being able to provide is common throughout. It's just the social conditions under which that's done has changed from subsistence agriculture to now the industrial age with these miners mm -hmm. and now obviously they're in a state where they're trying to figure out like what's what's next now that this mining 
wage work has been taken away from me, but I still need to provide because that's tied to who I am as a man. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, you explain quite interestingly in the in the paper is so there's a lot of uh, history that uh, Tabang goes through just to paint the context. And one of the interesting things that he mentions in the paper about uh, Valcom is that there's two large clocks uh, in the CBD. And historically, this was done um, so that obviously, wherever you are in the city, you have a clear concept of what the time is because the town was built on industry and mining, right? So you couldn't be caught out in the streets and not know that it's, <laughs> that it's, it's now. Yeah. In a context where so many of those mine workers who use those clocks um, to determine the cycle of their life and when it's time to go home and all that kind of stuff, what do those monuments now represent? Because they're ultimately relics and if anything, uh, a point of pain for wage-earning men uh, that reminds them that the time of you having a certain type of manhood integrity uh, mm. Is gone and the clock is still is still ticking. Yeah. How 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 you know do they navigate some of these? Let me say triggers mm. uh, such as these clocks. Mm. And and so I, you know the question of time is very important to the to the world that we live in. Right? Yeah. And we always hear in public speak or in popular speak that time is money. Right. 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 And that had to be in, engraved into people's psyches mm. by putting clocks. Um, um, you know, everywhere, basically. Yeah. You know, um, even the church. You know, the yeah, the, the bell. Yeah. You know, like these are these are all important for discipline, right? Because in order for any economy to work, you have to have discipline. You have to have disciplined workers that come to show up at work on time that stick to their work schedules, that knock off on time, but also workers that um, know that on weekends they can only enjoy themselves to a certain extent. Mm. Sunday they have to rest, Monday they have to come back to work. So work doesn't only shape, sorry, time doesn't only shape our sense of, uh, uh, you know, our sense of activities in work, but also our social activities. Mm. Um, and so, having been working on the mines for so long, and having been acclimatized to a certain rhythm of time, in unemployment, that rhythm of time was disrupted. Mm. Mm. In the morning, they had nowhere to go. There was nowhere to report. There was no one waiting for them. Mm. Right? And so there's a shift in how they relate to the question of time. There's no, there's still time, but there's no work, right? And so, what did they do with this time that they had? You know, they hung around, they drank, mm. they looked for work. Um, yeah. You know, they found things to fix in the household. Yeah. Uh, one day they're clearing grass, the other day they're mending the fence, or even just chatting to neighbors and doing that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but one gets the sense that the, the, yeah, so there was a massive shift in, in how they experienced time um, between when they were working and when they were no longer working in the sense that it seemed like they, they had a lot of time on their hands and mm. very little to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And also those that were around them. Uh, you know, I didn't only interview the mine workers, I also tried to get a sense of the community. community. Okay. Yeah. And the, the question of stigma, and maybe you want to ask about this later, but also the question of stigma was related to the fact that these guys are just sitting around. Right, yes, and yes. So because in an in a industrial society, or in a capitalist society, or in a society where work is so central, we're expecting you to use your time to be productive. productive yes. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so once you're not productive, it's almost as if, yeah. um, you know, you, you idle. Right. You're wasting time. Right. Right? Right. Things like that. And they, there's a stigma attached to that. Okay. It's... <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, 
there's something related to that stigma that I want to touch on later, um, uh, which is coming probably in a f few seconds. Um, one of the things I wanted to explore, because you mentioned it, is the question of black bodies, right? Um, and the context of black bodies is to work on the mines, <clears throat> from what you explain in the paper, was you needed to go through a dehumanizing medical examination. So basically, miners uh, were taken to a medical exam, you had to be stripped naked. Uh, so whether you were young or old, we're all stripped naked. And the examination itself was just literally a stethoscope being put yeah. on your heart. So you, you didn't actually have to be naked for that, mm. right? But I think there's obviously uh, psychological uh, um, programming behind why they did that. And one of the quotes from one of the mine workers said, mining is for strong men. The work, under, the work underground can be endured only by those with firm and tough knees. Men suckled properly by their mothers. Cowards and weaklings are revealed. The white man does not tolerate such bedwetters. Mm. Now, if there's this idea of you need to be a strong black body in order to work in the mines, conversely, what does it now mean for you having been let go, mm. right, from the very same mines? Does that mean, you know, you're not strong enough, you're not man enough, you know, what is the thinking in terms of what the converse experience has done to these men? Yeah, so that quote is from a classic book, let me just say that it's from a classic yes. book yeah. on, uh, on, the, on, this, uh, on this topic. But to answer your question directly, that what does it mean, yeah. how do they relate to their bodies now that they're unemployed? Um, Okay, before I answer that question, sure. We just go. If we can just take a, we go, we'll go to the workers' museum in Newtown. Newtown, yes. Right, and we just look at the pictures that are displayed on the on in that museum. Yeah, it's mostly pictures of half-naked black men with muscular, very well ripped, strong bodies. Right. Usually, like with sweat, and you can see yeah. that these people are tough. Right? And so that's the idea of, or the imagery, or the, the, you know, the, the representation of what a mine worker's body looks like. Mm, right? mm. And beyond the body, these men also have their own kind of embodied masculinity or, or kind of psychological notions of what a mine worker should be or right. should look like. Right. Uh, and this is inculcated through this medical examination mm. of of the doctor having to look at your body. Yes. Um, if it's a body that is fit to work in the mind. So they come from a history of being socialized into thinking of their own bodies as strong, tough bodies that are able to work under strenuous conditions and that kind of thing. So when they become unemployed, the, the, even the, the sense of their body shift. Mm. Right? Mm. So they then describe unemployment through images of um, bodies with missing parts. So a person would say unemployment is like not having an arm or not having a leg. So what it, it signifies is that they no longer see their bodies um, as strong and tough bodies. They see their bodies mm -hmm. as having become very weak and almost in incomplete, hmm. right? But there's also a sense in which they talk about the body as sick or unemployment as like... Yes, as a sickness. As a right. sickness, yes. right? And so sickness, if we think about sickness or think about being amputated, those are anomalies, mm -hmm. right? Those are... If you're sick, there's something not normal or something that is not quite right with right. with your body and that kind of thing. Yeah. So they were kind of trying to to explain in a metaphor that this is not my body. Mm. Um, and it's become so powerless, so weak because of unemployment. So unemployment shifts sure. not only people into poverty, but right. it also shifts people's ideas of themselves and how they relate to their own bodies. Um, you know, so, so and, and those are some of the effects mm. of unemployment beyond the economic question, yeah. Sure. 
I think uh, I feel like uh, I need a, a second just to <laughs> digest that because I, I, yeah. I mean I can only imagine right um, even though your focus of your paper was on mine workers yeah. that if this is true for the experience of unemployment for mine workers we can only imagine what it's like in a in a modern city like Johannesburg, mm. Cape Town, all of this kind of stuff. Add to that the pressure of Indot Damast and all of that. And there's a lot happening yeah. <laughs> inside these men in terms of how they perceive themselves as as men in their masculine in, in integrity. Um, one of the questions then um, related to the to the body and what you mentioned for these mine workers is there was a sentence that I liked um, that said, passing the medical examination was a measure of a man's fitness uh, and industry. But mind work was also, Copeland comments, destructive for the body. Work on the minds destroys the body and soul, but to get there is not only necessary, but manly and heroic. So is there, do you think, a sense where part of the honor of being able to be a mine worker was the fact that masculine integrity is not only linked to provision, but that provision comes through being able to endure tough situations that might bring your destruction in one way or, or another. And now that that's been taken away, it's kind of like, well, what enemy am I enduring uh, to, pro to provide for my family? Would you say yeah. that's, that's kind of like maybe what they, they felt or, or going through? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's also like historical findings on this on this subject is also that they didn't understand masculinity through violence. Mm. So this question of violence it's wasn't wrong. you you couldn't um, express your masculinity through it wasn't seen as an expression of masculinity to be violent. Right. right. The expression of masculinity was um, can I work um, and provide for my family. Can I work and sustain uh, my household? Right. And that, that, that's, that it, it was around those two notions. The question of violence and all of that wasn't... No, it wasn't. Yeah. But of course, I mean, you know, these guys, we have to locate them in the right context in that they were working under a violent system of racial oppression. Yes. And being pushed around by uh, white mind workers. Yes. You know. And so, so they had to to develop a sense, you know, a ways of survival, mm. um, even mm. against this brutal system, mm. um, the 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 workplace that was shaped yeah. by racial tensions and so on. But still, they didn't. They never defined masculinity through violence. Mm. It was always through the ability to provide. Right. Yeah. I'd like to read a passage that speaks to linking uh, this provision and concept of, of masculinity. In the passage, Tawang says, I traveled to Lesotho in June 2013 to conduct more interviews. I wanted to compare and get an understanding of how context, if at all, shapes and influences understandings of masculine integrity. I inquired from former mine workers if there's any difference between Lesotho and Valcom in how masculine integrity is understood. In Lesotho, they said, to a greater extent than in Valcom, there was a sharper focus on subsistence farming as a way of surviving and redeeming masculine integrity. I quote, in Valcom, people stand by the garage and ask for peace jobs. Sometimes they wait the whole day without getting anything. Here, Lesotho, we do not do that. I do agricultural activities that will allow me to put food on the table. I plant cabbage, corn, and time and again, we will slaughter an animal to eat and sell to get some money. Those are the things I do to protect my status as a man and my family. Another quote from someone else. We build our houses on the highlands. The lowlands are used for agriculture. As men, we wake up in the morning to plow the fields and take care of the animals. That is what being a man means here. There are structural reasons for the differences in Lesotho and South Africa that Valcom is far more urban and industrialized than Lesotho. And I think this speaks to what you were mentioning earlier about the, the context or the social context um, differing, mm -hmm. but ultimately the driver of I need to earn a livelihood to provide, which is linked to my masculine integrity, is ultimately the, the thread. And it's almost like, it's probably not intentional, it's almost like these Lesotho men look down on the Valcom guys because, ah, 
these guys go to the corner and they try and hustle. Mm. Us who are here, we work the land and, 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 and that kind of thing. And it's almost like there's a sense of, 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 of pride because uh, I think it says, yeah, redeeming their masculine uh, uh, integrity. What was your other impressions between the difference in the men from Lesotho and the men from Valcom in the context of this passage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think context shapes how people experience unemployment. Right. Um, so the key impression that I got from the comparison between the different contexts is that different contexts give different resources. Ah. And that has an implication on how one is able to survive right. uh, and how one is able to renegotiate gender identity and all of that. Right. So in, in Velcom, the, the connection between wage labor and masculinity didn't shift. Right. It, right. Was, it was solid because they, even when coming there, whether it's South African migrants or migrants from, from Lesotho or other neighboring countries, when they went to Velcom, they went to Velcom to earn wages. Right. And it's different to the countryside because the countryside, they never really saw it as a place for wages. Mm. Right. So mm -hmm. there, the, it's, it's almost like returning back to the land, right? the, the, the way in which people talk about returning back to the rural. Right, right. Yeah, so then the connection to the land becomes more prominent right. than the connection to, to wages uh, because of that context. And that has implications on uh, conceptions of manhood and how people experience unemployment by shifting... Uh, between contexts. Not to say that unemployment is not devastating in either, either context, but yeah, yeah. it's still devastating, but different re resources to navigate through it become available. One of the things um, we spoke earlier um, about the stigma of unemployment, and there's some yeah, I would say very painful uh, stories also in the in the in the paper, <clears throat> and I'd like to read a passage uh, for our viewers just to get a uh, a sense of some of the things you uncovered. In the absence of wages, strict gendered divisions of labor in the household overturned. Often, such tension would re result from the former mine workers' incapacity to meet expectations of them for provisions such as food and clothing. And I quote, being unemployed caused a lot of problems for my family. There are always conflicts. Things were not the same as before when we were still working. Now I could not meet their needs, but sometimes it seems like they do not understand. So I was always under pressure. They suspected their spouses of having affairs with employed men who could provide for their basic needs. Quote from another worker, my wife was having an affair right in front of my eyes with the working men. You can even ask me for gang. I used to call him and tell him that I am fighting with my wife. It was bad. There's a man who works at the municipality who stays at Mshengoville, which is a section in the township. They call him Muchedi. He was driving a white Honda. He would pass here and my wife would follow the car and get in at the corner. When I asked her where she came from, she would make noise saying, you're not working, other men are working. All you do is watch me all day. So I realized she wanted me to beat her so that she could call the police to arrest me. Where will I work? Because where I work, my company is closed and her boyfriend's company is not. Former mine workers felt emasculated as unemployment stripped them of a core aspect of masculine integrity. Quote, unemployment has taken away my status as a man. A man gets his status from providing for his family. If I cannot provide for my family, what status is there? They were called with degrading names. Usikatana mashlong abatoha usu sorry for butchering Sutu, says you are nothing to people when you do not have a job. Mashalela is a term for someone who is unemployed, but it has negative connotations describing someone who has assumed a posture of resignation that is morally repulsive. Definitely a lot going on here. Um, so can you take us through some of the, and I'm sure these are just the top highlights that you gave, um, that journey of emasculation, mm. right? Uh, so the one guy, the wife is having an affair, you're called and all of that kind of stuff. Um, 
what did that process mean to these men? One, two, in you interviewing them, uh, when you did, did it look like there's any way forward in terms of any kind of healing? Right, because I think when you felt emasculated and you're no long, longer a man, that stays with you for a while. Yeah. Um, and thirdly, how do we relate that experience in the broader context of South African society with what's happening um, with our higher unemployment rate, GBV, and, and all of that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me start with the last part of the question yeah. right, around GBV. Um, and just to say that I didn't find any direct link, link between right. the two, right? Um, that even GB, GBV can happen even where people have jobs yes. and, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that that narrative that, you know, yes, there are gender tensions in the household. Yes. Definitely. Right. And it's not a way of blaming the woman or blaming the man. Yes. Right. We're saying that Wage, wage labor is important for the dynamics of the household. And once you take that out, tensions will emerge. Mm. And they express themselves as gendered tensions. Right? It's not to blame women or blame men. Right. It's to understand the, rela the gender relation between the two um, in the context of the absence of wage labor. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so... Definitely. And then these men also had suicidal mm. thoughts, mm. you know, because they had a sense that uh, they, they become useless. Um, their sense of worth right. just disappears when they become unemployed. They are not able to be men in the same way that they, they were when they had wages. And so things change in the household. Things change in the community things change at the personal level. Even relations with their children change. Yeah. Right? So it's a, it's a change in so many different aspects of their lives. Even the relationship with the church changes. Wow. Right? Uh, you know, some of the guys would say, yeah, you know, the, the, at the church, yes, the church provides support, but it's embarrassing when it's time to take out the money the yeah, yeah. to give the offering or when there are trips and other activities that require money in the church and mm. they're mm. not able to mm. provide so it's far reaching and some of them tend to read whatever happens in their lives through this idea that I'm unemployed it could be other reasons you know infidelity isn't specific to, to them and I didn't really try and establish whether it was true Right. That the wife was, was having an affair. Right. Because for me it's not yeah. It's not important, right? What's important is that they think it's happening. And what's important for this topic is that they think it's happening with a man with a job. Mm. Right? Mm. So why yeah. is it a man with a job? And that kind of tells us that there is a hierarchy in their own minds, mm. a hierarchy of men, that a man that is unemployed is not the same yes, as a man right. that doesn't work. So, <clears throat> so, so, sorry, a man that is unemployed is not the same as a man that is employed. Right. There's a hierarchy of masculinities that are mediated by the labor market. Mm. And so, so that's where the economy comes in. That the economy isn't just about making money or, or producing things. The economy is how, it's about how people relate to one another. Hmm. And, and, and you see that when you, when you look at the question of unemployment and how men rank one another by whether you work or not. But it's not just men. Society does that hmm. too, right? We, sense, we, we tend to attribute personal value or if one wants to gauge how much respect to give, to yeah. give right? Yeah. The question of work comes in. And it's not a surprise that usually when you meet a new person or you're trying to get to know a person, one of the first few questions that arise is what, what do, do you do? What do you do for <laughs> yeah, a living? Yeah. Right? Why that question? 
because it gives the other person, the one who's asking, a, a way to gauge where to put you in the social hierarchy and what kind of respect and dignity mm -hmm. and value to attribute mm -hmm. to you. So the, so the economy becomes, uh, yeah, it, it's not just about the income, the GDP, and all of that is important, but it also shapes how people relate to one another and how we value each other as people. And the labor market is one way of doing that. So in a country like South Africa where you've got high unemployment, that's what's happening, right? Um, people's sense of self, people's sense of self-worth is undermined by others because they don't work, or even people themselves, the unemployed themselves, may, you know, have doubt about their own place in the world and whether their lives mean anything and whether they are playing a significant role in society just because they don't have a job. Mm, 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 mm. One of the th <clears throat> things in this uh, emasculation process, you mentioned the relationships with their community, with their families and all of that has, yeah, has changed and did you find that there were any systems of support um, for men to navigate this almost emasculation process. Um, so either in the form of counseling or how did they, you know, try and, and navigate and, and, and make sense of it? Yeah. So I didn't find any evidence of, for example, the mine interventions from the mine right. or interventions from government. There might have been, but I didn't find any structure, structural True, programs right. that were dealing with that. But the men themselves came up with their own ways of trying to heal and deal with it, if yeah. you want to use Yeah. So one way was uh, they had formed a group of ex-mine workers. There were about 15 of them. And they would meet almost every Wednesday. Oh. The purpose of the meeting, though, was to try and get their jobs back or to force the mines to take their sons and employ them, because that was the historical practice in the mines. Um, but what it ended up being was almost like a support group, because I'm saying it was almost like a support group because they used that opportunity to share each other's experiences uh, in the same way that workers would share experiences of exploitation and not being paid well enough and then mm -hmm. likes mm -hmm. when workers are still employed these guys came together to try and talk about oh, how bad mm -hmm. things have become mm -hmm. um how do you deal with this yeah. uh you know yeah uh, you know that kind of thing but the other question involved alcohol the other group i mean to say involved alcohol Oh, okay. So, there, there is a hospital in Velcom that used to belong to the mine, right? Now it's revamped, it's a, it's a it's government hospital. This hospital that used to belong to the mine, behind it, there's a drinking place called Hapilis, mm. meaning the place of self-medication. Oh, wow. <laughs> The hospital, the mine hospital, was used by the mining companies to conduct the silicosis TB examination. Right, right. Because you know in the gold industry, the, oh, yeah. the, the tysis is very yeah. prominent, right? Yeah. And these men don't live very long after contracting yeah. and being retrenched. Yeah. You know? And in my case, I find that actually about 10 years or so. In, in the, in the wow. Yeah. So back to the question of uh, the Happy Lisi, right? So these guys used to congregate at a place called Happy Lisi, self-medication. So I interviewed some of them and I asked them why. Why is this place called Happy Lisi and what, 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 what is really going on? Please help me understand. And they said, look, we're going through a tough time, depression, nothing is going for our lives, and this is a place where we come and self-medicate. Hmm. Uh, even though it's briefly, 
um, you know, we congregate here, we drink, we talk about, uh, and we kind of forget uh, for a little while uh, the, the terrible state of our lives, you know? Um, and obviously some of them disagreed with that. So there's one guy who disagreed with this idea that you can self-medicate through alcohol. Mm. Mm. So he says, no, those guys are wrong. Mm. You know, you can't do that. You can't self-medicate through alcohol. He says to me, Tavang, if alcohol solves problems, I would drink it so much <laughs> that my problems, all of them, <laughs> right. would go away and never right. come back. So he was critiquing this idea that medication, alcohol, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and so how he dealt with his unemployment wasn't through alcohol. It was through, um, you know, networks and, and uh, yeah, just trying to, to find alternative ways other than through the alcohol. And in the bigger scheme of things, having spent the amount of time that you did speaking to all these different men in a very difficult circumstance uh, that they were going through, for you personally, what do you walk away from when you ponder the question of the state of masculinity in, in, in South Africa? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe this question will be two parts. One, looking at the state of masculinity in South Africa, what is it that gives you hope and encouragement mm -hmm. and what is it about the state of masculinity that potentially scares you and freaks you out like uh, we need to fix this mm -hmm. yeah I think I think there's a crisis of masculinity definitely yeah um, and I think that crisis has to do with the this current conception of masculinity that is linked to wage yeah. labor yeah that's definitely part of it it's not the whole story right and I'm not saying that labor, we should get rid of labor yes. and let people survive on grants yeah, yeah. or on entrepreneurship. I don't think yeah. that's feasible, right? We still need labor. But I think we do need, and so we still need labor, and I think labor has a future. But I don't think everyone has a future in labor. Mm, mm. And so, which means that we need an alternative way of thinking about this relation between masculinity. And the positive thing is that if mas masculine identity shifted earlier in that period between uh, before the mines and after, you remember okay. there was that shift? Yes, yes. It's 70s, 80s, I think, yeah. in your paper you said, yeah. If that shift could happen, it means that we could have another shift. shift. Yes, right. And that's what gives me hope. But I don't know what the next shift, shift will be. Yeah. Yeah. But the idea that masculinities are not fixed, that they can shift and change, and that different contexts can lead to different conceptions of masculinity, that means we can have a, an alternative conception of masculinity. But I don't know where the future is going because I think it's so uncertain. No one can tell where the future is going. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think there's a little bit of hope mm -hmm. in the idea that we can have alternative masculinities that are not so intertwined with wage labor, especially in countries with high unemployment like South Africa, mm -hmm. because that is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I don't think, and I'm not being a pessimist or a doomsayer, right, but I don't think that we are any time going to achieve full employment. And so, if we still have that relationship between manhood and wage labor, with this little small prospect of full employment, you know, that, then it means that it, it, it's a huge, huge, huge crisis. Um, yeah, mm. but, but yeah, there's, there is some hope in the sense that masculinities can shift. Okay, yeah. That's very encouraging to hear you uh, say that because ultimately why this show exists uh, to challenge ourselves to figure out what's next um, to look at the current status quo and sort of say you know where do we take things and ultimately it's in our hands uh, to shape that um, and with that I'd like to thank you so much for dedicating some of your time uh, to come on the show and talk about your incredible work and I'd like to thank you for uh, your work 
Uh, looking forward to having you on the show again. I uh, hope you'll continue in this line of work because I think it's definitely something that gives us a moment of pause, a moment of reflection um, as we all navigate uh, all of this together. Um, any closing comments uh, on your side? No, I'd just like to thank you. And I think this is very important, um, especially this question of masculinity and gender relations. Yeah. I think it's spot on. So my last comment would be a compliment to you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks uh, for joining us, guys. Uh, subscribe, like, share, comment, um, and let's keep the conversation going. See you in the next episode. Thank you.